So like one of the major changes. Alright, so uh, so uh, the game was released, re-released digitally for the Wii Virtual Console in 2009. No changes were made to the N64 version, as it was just an emulation of the game. However, all N64 games were. 240p resolution, while Virtual Console games support 480p. The Virtual Console version also has much less lag as the N64 version lags with particle effects such as snow and blur effects in cutscenes, which you'll see a big difference right here in the speed of that cutscene. Um, new areas also load faster on the Virtual Console. Both versions are 4x3 and have 60 frames of input recognition but 20 visual frames per second. So, uh, upon starting the game, the player can manage save files where they can start or continue previous playthroughs. The player chooses their name and then jumps uh, right into the story. I will briefly describe the premise. This game is a sequel to Ocarina of Time and picks up right where that left off. Without really spoiling anything, the main character, Link, goes off in search of his friend that left at the end of the game. While doing so, his horse gets stolen from him, uh, from the main antagonist, Skull Kid, and Link chases him to a new unknown world. Link soon finds out that the moon will crash and destroy the town in a mere three days and takes the responsibility to prevent that. Yeah, this game is like, uh, highly story oriented, so... I'm gonna try to, uh, make this so that you can actually see. Alright, so... Jumping right into gameplay, here I am in the middle of the overworld. This is one of the three games for the Nintendo 64 that required the expansion pack add-on to the system, which allows for more detailed textures, many more actors and objects in the field, as well as a larger seeing distance compared to its prequel, Ocarina of Time. As you can see, the game is 3D, single-player game in an open world. The main focus of the game, and other Zelda games for that matter, is exploration. Movement is fairly basic. The control stick moves you around with uh, A to roll faster, and uh, the B button swings your sword, R button raises your shield, and uh, the C buttons use your equipped items. You can also fix the camera forward or target an enemy with the Z button, so uh, right there. The A button is also used to read signs, talk to NPCs, and interact with objects. The top left corner of the HUD shows hearts, which shows how much health you have at any given time. You start the game with a maximum of three hearts, but if you choose to look for more heart pieces hidden throughout the game, aside from the main quest to gain more, up to a mass of 20. This is the main idea behind how this game chooses to balance gameplay. You can compete complete the game with the bare minimum upgrades for extra difficulty, or a player can search for upgrades to make the game easier to beat at the expense of time. 
Underneath the hearts is the magic meter. Instead of ammo, some items drain the magic bar a set amount to use. So, like, if I were to charge a sword spin, that uses a little bit of that. And, uh... The B button icon in the top middle always displays the strongest sword you own. And the C buttons on the top right show the currently equipped items and their ammo if available. So, like, you have bombs, and when you use each one, the ammo goes down. Um... Upon pausing, the inventory first shows the available items you can equip. These items either work as weapons, or help you progress through your quests. So like, uh... Here you have a fire arrow that uh, uses magic as well as arrows, to like, that can like melt ice. Or you have a hook shot, so you can reach places that you normally wouldn't be able to reach. Alright, so here's the map subscreen. Uh, this shows the map of the entire world of the game and your current position, which is uh, right here. Um, initially it's empty, but as you explore, you can eventually reveal the entire thing. And here's the quest status screen. This shows what key equipment and events you've done in your playthrough. This... includes songs learned, where, uh, playing songs in this game is, like, an important feature, because they do different things depending on who you play them to. It's still with, like, an ocarina? Or it's yes, it's still with an ocarina. Um... Right, so I can demonstrate. So you use the ocarina, you pull it out, and then you play the notes with the C buttons. So for Song of Healing, you would play that, and then that would play. And the idea is that you want to play them in the right situations, because they're usually very situational. So, um, uh, it also shows your current sword and shield and the bomb bag and quiver, so, like, you have a sense of your equipment. Um, it shows the amount of dungeons you beat, like, you want to beat all four dungeons, this shows, like, your progress through all of that, as well as, uh, how many heart pieces you have. And then, uh, here's, uh, something that's completely optional for this game that adds a lot to it. Um, it's the Bomber's Notebook. Throughout, uh, the town, there's a bunch of people that need help, and if you help them, you can, uh, like, get optional rewards and stuff. And, uh, it, it, like, gives a sense of character development, and you have, like, some connection to the people that you're saving. So, uh, one of the main ideas of Majora's Mask is, uh, the actual masks that you can use. So, like, most of these masks, uh, in fact, all of these on the left, except for, uh, the three on the right, are just, uh, normal, like, masks that are often situational, or you use them for some sort of, uh, purpose. So, actually, I'll, I'll, like, kind of show it. So, like, this is your normal running speed, but if you put on the bunny hood, you actually move faster, which that could be, like, a useful thing to do. And, uh, this is the Blast Mask, where if you press B, you create an instant explosion at the cost of hurting yourself. And then, like, some masks have absolutely no purpose, so, like, this mask, it doesn't even really do anything. There's no point to it, except for being silly. Um, there's also Transformation Masks, so... Uh,
which allow Link to take the form of other races, uh, which open up new abilities. This is a key aspect of the game. So like, uh, as this form, you can uh, spin and shoot bubbles. And the Goron, you can roll around and pound and punch. And like, uh, Zora, you can shoot boomerangs, have a magical barrier. And because you're taller, you can also like, climb areas that you normally wouldn't be able to. So like, right there. Um, the main draw to this, uh, game is the sense of time. The clock on the bottom shows the current day and hour. When the clock reaches 6 a.m. on the third night, the moon crashes and you lose. A standard game hour is 45 seconds, and with 72 hours, that's about 54 minutes until the moon crashes. A common complaint with new players is that there is not enough time to explore and that they feel rushed. However, it becomes very manageable and the player learns how to use it over time. The clock only moves when it's still. Also, time can be manipulated through the use of songs, so like, going back to the ocarina, which is actually a different instrument depending on what uh, form you are. So like, if I were to play the inverted song of time, um, it slows time down three times, so like, you have three times as much time as normal when you use that, which gives you way more time, and the song of double time, is used to advance time forward, uh, either to the next day or night, which that can be useful, because certain events in this game only happen at certain times, like, they really integrated the clock into the gameplay. As for saving, since, like, at the end of the third day it's all over, you do have the ability to go back in time. So if you play the Song of Time, you can save all of your progress, but, like, the reason you can't just, like, use this everywhere is because it only saves, like, your current equipment and items. It gets rid of all your, uh, ammo and, like, any, like, sort of events that you've done. It will reset all of that. So you have to learn, like, when good times to save are, and get as much done as you can. Um, the game is actually pretty good with this, with the uh, replay value, because uh, even after beating the game, you can go back and redo any part of it you want with uh, the new items. And uh, here's one of the main changes that was added to the North American version of the game. Um, the Japanese version already had the owl statues, but they were used to just like warp from place to place with the Song of Soaring. However, on the American version, you can use it as a quick save. So, um, at various points in the game, there's owl statues where you can do a one-time quick save so that the next time you play, you're at exactly the same state you left off. So like it keeps it keeps uh, all your current time and stuff as if you just continued. Yeah, you, it's it's one time. Meaning, if I were to reset right now, that I'll say it wouldn't be there anymore. Like as soon as you load it, then it's you're done. But if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah, you could you could use the owl again, and if you wanted to save your owl, you could keep your owl save and then copy it to another file if you wanted to use it again. Alright, so... There's four dungeons in this game, and they need to be beaten in order to complete the main quest. A dungeon is an area with a series of rooms and enemies and puzzles. So, like, here we have the first room of the dungeon, and then... There's a bunch of switches, and, like, a new player would have, like, no idea what to do. Like, you would just, the main point is to, uh, explore and, uh, move around figure out what to do. So, um, 
Solving the puzzle will grant you access to the next room, and you can find keys, which is counted in the bottom left, to open locked doors. Each dungeon has a new item um, that you get for defeating a mid-boss that helps you access the rest of the dungeon. And at the end of the dungeon is a boss that you fight. Defeating a boss gives you its remains and frees a giant. Once all four giants are, freeze, are freed, they can hold up the moon and stop it from crashing down. Well, that's how like they tie in the dungeons to the story there. Um, the dungeons also have an optional quest of finding uh, 15, fair 15 stray fairies. So they're like uh, hidden about throughout here. So um, that's completely optional, but if you do it, you get a pretty good reward, uh, depending on the dungeon. The game is fairly open, and through an order uh, for completing the game... Oh, though an order for completing the game is suggested, it is uh, not enforced. Alright, and you can also see, like, in the bottom right, there's a, a little mini-map in the corner. Um, the red arrow shows where you came from, the yellow sh arrow shows your current position, and if there were enemies in this room, they would be uh, represented by red dots, and uh, treasure chests would be represented by uh, brown squares. Um, so I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about just how this works. Uh, so I'm not, I don't want to like overwhelm with information, but, uh, Alright, so here's like, here's the entire scene of, uh, the temple that I'm in, where, uh, here's the map of the first room. Okay, so, um, the game loads, uh, each area, small bits at a time. There are many seeds in the game, which load scenery that you can, uh, walk around in. Each scene has one or more maps, which for a dungeon would be the current room. So, like, uh, the current... The map that you're currently in, that's that's where it loads all the textures, but if you like look, all these other rooms are still there, but only the textures for the room that you're currently in show up. Okay, so, that also is true for the actors, so actors such as uh, enemies and stuff, they'll only appear in the room that you're loaded in. So. Uh, demonstrate like so normally going between maps is uh, unnoticeable by the player so if I were to walk and enter a new map like right here it looks pretty smooth but the other area actually unloaded and this is like not something that someone would uh, immediately recognize however um when you transition between two scenes, which contains like all the rooms, it's more obvious because there's a fade to black. So if I were to like open a door, there's like a complete change in transition right there. So um, uh, to give a more visual example, like here you have the first room, and then uh, every room is the same scene except for the boss room which is this square right here and that's the door that you normally use to open it and like the silly thing about this is that it's extremely close to the first uh room of the dungeon right there so um with some creativity uh i will close this all right so here i am in the first room of the dungeon as before, but I can use a bomb to push myself through the slope, and with the right angle, you can skip completely all the way to the boss room immediately without doing any of the dungeon. So, like, 
even if you just started, you could go straight to the boss from there. And it's things like this that make playing the game fun for me. There's a lot of control given to you, and there's a lot of replay value in the game, figuring out how to do things faster, or reach places that are meant to be uh, inaccessible. So I'm going to like show off something cool that you could do in this fight, actually, as soon as it starts. If you use the uh, Goron mask, since Goron can't be in water, it respawns you to the top of uh, the beginning of the game, or the beginning of the boss scene. So from here, I'm going to try to respawn again after getting the boss's attention. Alright, so, um, without getting, like, too in-depth, uh, there's a glitch you can do to, uh, use your, uh, explosives to stand still in the air, and the way that works is that when you crouch stab, if you interact with an object as your sword is coming back, your sword never stops swinging, and when you're in that state, if you shield something in the air, it keeps you in place, and, like, the main idea behind that, like, the way the game logic uh, works there is that if you try to swing your sword, you can't fall off of ledges. So that using that, I can uh, stay in the air. But that's like complicated to explain. So if I did this properly, the boss comes and attacks me from all the way up here, and there's no escape from this. Alright, um... I actually prepared one little video that shows off a pretty cool uh, glitch, or trick, or whatever you want to call it. So, uh... Right here. I'll try to explain things as they happen. So, when you enter an area on Epona and save in an owl statue, you can, uh, when you reload the owl save, you'll still be on Epona. So, the benefit of this is that you can actually use an item on Epona, which is normally impossible. So here I play the Song of Soaring, which allows me to warp to other owl statues on the map. So if I do this, you can get Epona into Clock Town, where Epona, which is a horse by the way, normally you can't get the horse into like the town area or any like rooms or anything like that, but with this, now you can be uh, in town with that. And if I repeat this again, I can use another item on Epona. So, If I pull out the ocarina here, and then cancel it, I have complete control of Epona. And Epona can completely ignore scene transitions. So from here, I can press A to get back on Epona, and then when I get off, I can completely bypass the scene transition. So, I'm still in the same map, and that's actually a different owl statue than the one that's in South Clock Town. Um, since you can, like, look in there, they, they just, like, put it a different one. So, I played this song a double time there to, uh, make my respawn location the same spot as next to the owl. And, uh, there I stored a song, the song of time, so that when the next text box appears, it will, uh, ask me if I want to, uh, save the game. And there I do something similar to dive with text. And something cool about this, if you save at the exact frame you void out, you get warped to this credits map right here. Like, this is a map that's special that shows up directly in the credits. 
and I use a bomb to displace myself so that I can hookshot the torch to skip uh, the scene transition there. Because if I if I open any doors or go through any transitions, I'll go back to the title screen. And then here, that text box lets me save. And saving here shows this, the bank closing. And this is like not shown anywhere in the game. Like it's normally absolutely impossible to see that. Like nobody even knew it existed. But on this credits map, if you do like this series of like glitches, you get this final result, which I think that's really cool. And uh, I guess I'll finish off my presentation by showing off a few screenshots that I've taken of things that are normally impossible in the game. So um, here's like the hook shot out of bounds. Uh, this, I'm floating in midair with the bomb chew over a tree. Standing on a switch without it pressing down, the bomb chew stuck to the wall. I am jumping out of bounds to the compass chest, skipping the sunblock completely. Uh, I have the false mask on. Uh, this one is uh, just the boss coming from the top down to the bottom, which is normally impossible. And then more out of bounds stuff here. Uh, yeah. So. That's Majora's Mask. Great, brother. Let's <laughs> focus on the glitches. It was an interesting, good point to make. Be, um, you know, it's all these things that, to a, a traditionally designer, regard, all these are bugs that really we should be fixing. Um, but they you know, provide this whole other aspect to the game for the people like yourself who are very interested in you know, finding them and using them. And, Like, there's things that were in Ocarina of Time that stayed in this game, which makes me think that, like, they knew about it, but because it wasn't detrimental to the game, they chose to, like, fix, like, more important things, like, uh, which is that a normal player would find and, like, crash the game or something. So, like, none of, none of these actually hinder a normal game for it. Yeah. Let's go to one. It's hindering normal game play. It's a difference when it's a, a single player game, you know, it only messes up your play, whereas right. multiplayer online games and the designer designers and companies are worried about, you know, somebody can exploit this glitch to beat other players, then it seems unfair that they have to worry about it more. more. So it's nice that they can feel that they felt free to leave them in for this. Finding glitches and doing speedruns are completely like interconnected because um, the glitches are often used to like make the game faster. Like as you saw, I went straight from the beginning of the Great Bay Temple all the way to the boss, which is much faster than just like going through the game normally. So there is a big community that looks that some of the people just do the speedruns with uh, the current knowledge, and then some people try to advance that, try to find new stuff. Or they'll just try to find stuff for fun, like something that's like completely useless for going fast, but just because it's fun to do. Given the age of the game, do you think most of the people playing it these days are doing that sort of thing, or is there still a lot of people playing it? Um, nowadays, like you can still see people uh, playing it on like streaming websites. The majority of people playing it are doing speedruns, right. and. Uh, playing it like this because this is where like most of the replay value is. Yeah. But there are people that like just do normal play through still, like people that like are playing the game for the first time or something. But it's not a small speedrun it's not just a minor thing it's a, it's a big part of the yeah. reason people play it So yeah. Like, as I said before, they come, they just took it and they emulated it. Like, they didn't make any changes to uh, the N64 version, ex 
except that it like runs faster with uh, the certain cutscenes that have the blur effect and like the particle effects that lag on that 64 don't lag anymore because the Wii is uh, better hardware. That the style of play that you sort of show here is still by with newer games. There are a lot of newer games that are less fun for me, just in some ways, like World of Warcraft. Yeah, there's newer games, but they're a lot, a lot less popular because uh, a lot of times when you find stuff and stuff in games like that, they'll get patched like uh, immediately. Where you can't, you can't patch this. It's no, it's not there. I have a GameCube to USB adapter that I use to play games. Is that just like play them on the PC like that? No, I this this was for the sake of convenience. When I play the game, I play it on the actual console. Which one? I play it on uh, both. I have every version. Would you say that like the clock is probably one of the most important um, parts of the game? Um, the clock is extremely important. It's like very important for actually rooting things and like because you have to do things at certain times. So a lot of the things when you're playing this game is like how do I get from point A to point B in the right amount of time and like what can I do to like use the perfect amount of time there. And like that's like one of my favorite things about this game and it like makes playing it and like doing certain things uh, in the right order fun. And, uh, yeah, I'd say that's, like, the key component, like, that idea of just, like, the Groundhog Day style thing, where you do the same three days over and over, and how you can just redo certain events. So that's what I'm wondering. It's a bit more afraid that going back in time is a major part of the play. Right. And, like, something interesting that I, like, uh, I don't think I mentioned is that, like, when you go through a dungeon, um, your progress isn't saved when you reset the cycle, but with, when you get the items, like say if you get the fire arrows from the snowhead dungeon and then start over, there'll be shortcuts based on the items to get you back to where you were sooner, which I really like that mechanic of the game. So like, uh, if you were to do it over, it's not like, oh my god, I have to redo everything, that I lost all this progress, it's like, I can go streamlined back to where I was. Do you say there's any major flaws in the game Um, I'm really biased because this is my favorite game, but there's like something I really don't like, and that's like the intro of this game. It's like way too long, and it's like, it would overwhelm like new players with like way too much information, because it's like, there's too much stuff coming at you at once, and you just gotta sit through it every time you want to play the game in front of the game. Like, there's no really fast way to get through it. Start the game once, save, at that point, reuse that save file. Yeah, but like, the idea of like the speedrun would be starting from a yeah. fresh yeah. file and getting all the way to the end.
Instead of showing the scene of like them getting married, um, like after like twice is saved, it's just like the spinning mask that you didn't get like in place of that. So it's like an incomplete ending. Kind of. Have you used the like like the character of the of an emulator is that you can uh, make a save state anywhere, so like, uh, it's like a quick save, except much faster, like you save, and then you can reload it at any time, and it'll be like, exactly the price that you left off. Oh, that, that's a utility of time, it's a, uh, it's made, that was made for Ocarina of Time, but like, since the game was so similar, that I was able to use it still for these maps. It, it just like shows uh, the levels and the scenes and the maps in the game and like 
there's other like uh, modification tools that you can like use to learn more about like the actual inside of the game. Because that's what I was thinking when we were doing it. That um, well, so, so, so somebody obviously like reverse engineered the model format or something like that to be able to do that. <laughs> loader for Blender or something like that and actually change the levels and use them in the game. Yeah, you can do modification with like any Nintendo 64 game, except the community for that is like non-existent. So you pretty much never see that outside of Super Mario 64. So long ago there was like all the custom Doom mods was a big thing that people were really building in the different places, you know, like alien can do that, but it's not really happening. Right, like, the current state of Nintendo 64 emulation isn't advanced enough, and there's, like, nobody working on it, so it remains to be seen. So under the you know the points of play, uh, you or anybody, which ones? What's being used here in Majora's Mask? Um, living out fantasies. Uh, destruction, kind of, because you're like really trying to the map to go outside. Oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah, it's all about the glitches. Of Or it certainly seems it's another, if it's not destruction, it could be another bullet point of a type of play, of, yeah. you know, breaking the system as opposed to, you know, when the book talks about destruction, it was more within the system of the game of building sandcastles and knocking them down, but following the rules, but, you know, breaking the rules, yeah, that's a good point. I think of, like, a single, single player game like this, or there can be a good, uh, like, a element of social as in middle school, I'd go over to my friend's house and we'd play Octavia at a time and go to the best. Yeah. 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 Certainly, uh, being able to play them with multiple people is a social experience. Yeah, that was yeah, pretty obvious. obvious. And, you know, so, um, and from what you were saying, well, you don't have to collect all the masks, right? Yeah, so it's a sort of sense of optional, all these things that you yeah. can do. Uh, there's some only a, some that are a few that are meant to be required, but like, you really don't need any. Like, they have like one time uses in the game. For the Icono thing, you can oh, right. need, like, the Gibbo mask to uh, go through the wild and stuff. What did the um, you use it to get a hard piece. If you hit a bush that disappears, the key finds will appear, and it will ask you a quiz for whatever reason, and then if you get all the answers right, you get a piece of fire. Yeah, like, only certain masks have, like, actual functionality. The other ones have, like, maybe you'll talk to a person and they'll, like, do something different.
So, <laughs> so what, are, what are the fun killers in it? Is there any micromanagement? The well, the well, the well. The well, the well, the well. What's the Do you want to talk about the well? The well. <laughs>
classic, let's go on an adventure, beat the bad guy, save the princess, let's do it. This is really more psychological. First dungeon boss, I think, is like one of the hardest because it's so unorthodox. But like, and then the last, the last boss, you're right because uh, he's really easy if you have the dying. Right. Like the idea is, if you actually play through the game with like the least amount of requirements, like the boss order difficulty makes sense. The boss order is fixed. You said there were four. I said no. no um, there's a recommended I mean, dungeon. 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 There's a recommended order, but you don't you can do it. But you don't necessarily have to do it in that order. I I thought you because can't you not get to a Pona without the Goron like without access to the Goron stuff? Like you need the powder keg to get into the ranch. You need the bow, the bow. Which is in the temple, but you don't have to be it. You can get the bow, go Okay, so you you actually have to go into the temple and see to me that logic at that point just I'm already here. I might as well just beat it. <laughs> Like, I, I, want to, I can't just walk in, this is all I wanted, boss, have a good day, we're going to come back to you with you later. <laughs> Oh, so I, I just brought up this remake for something like, I was like, the, there's a technological 